We are now starting part two of describing situations with quadratics. In this case, we have a cannon is 10 feet off the ground, launching a cannonball straight up with a velocity of 406 feet per second. But we're kind of taking an unrealistic view of this to keep it simple at first and imagine there's no gravity pulling down on the cannonball and it would just keep going upwards no matter what. So we want to fill out our table first. So try to fill out the table on your own and pause the video here. So if we're gonna do the distance above ground in feet, well, we know we're starting 10 feet above the ground at zero seconds. So every second that elapses, we're gonna be adding 406 feet to that, which means that we have 400 and 16 feet, and then we're going to add 406 to all of these, giving us 822 for 2, 1228 for 3, and so on and so on. And what's happening here, as you might guess, that our x values are going up by one each time. So we have plus one. And then our y values are going up by 406 feet, which we know that's the speed. Every single time it's going up by that same 406 feet. And so I know that that seems to be a linear relationship, something we're all familiar with from our uh, past chapters and years. So if I wanted to know the distance that is going after firing, well, I know that I'm going to start with 10 feet and I'm going to add 406 feet for every second that happens. So you would add 406 times the number of seconds. And that shows right there that it is most assuredly a linear relationship when there's no gravity involved at all. Now we can continue looking at cannonballs being shot and related them to quadratics. We made a table just a second ago of the values if there was no gravity present at all. And now we're looking in front of us at a table that is showing the actual heights of the ball after zero through five seconds. So let's transition to looking at these tables kind of near each other at all at once. On the left hand side, we can see the table from the beginning where we were talking about shooting the cannonball straight up into the air with no gravity present. That would show that we have 10 plus 406 feet per second and zero through five seconds, the same numbers we started with. The second table on the screen in front of us is the table from what we saw before where you are looking at the actual heights after zero through five seconds of the cannonball being shot into the air. So if we compare some of these numbers together, we can see that after zero seconds, they are both at 10 feet off the, in the air. Makes sense in that you haven't gone anywhere from that 10 foot high cannon. Otherwise, after that, after one second, we have the actual height from earlier without gravity is higher than each of the heights down here where they're actual, where they're supposed to be. And the difference is, in, if, for instance, 416 to 400 is obviously only 16 feet apart, but in row two, from the difference between 822 feet, hypothetically, and the real height of 758 is 64 feet. So that's a big difference right there. Now we're going to go back to Desmos in a second, but what we're going to be doing there is looking to plot both sets of the data that we've collected on the same coordinate plane and using the scale that you see in front of you on this graph. And then we're kind of comparing and contrast the points that we get from there. And then we're going to see if we can create an equation from all of that to make a quadratic to represent this real situation of shooting the cannonball straight into the air and having gravity actually affect it from there. So let's transition back to Desmos. Now that we're back here, we can start plotting our first one. We can see that that is linear, what we discussed earlier. 
So now our blue graph, you can see that we don't have any line connect to them. We don't have our function yet, but we can definitely see that they are not going to be near each other. And what we mentioned earlier, our hypothetical points are all higher than the actual heights if gravity is affecting it, which you might expect. So if we compare some of these points together, we can see, and we maybe want to write down the differences here. So these two are 16 apart. These two points here, we have 822 and 728. We already know from a few minutes ago that those are 64 apart. 64 apart. We can keep going with this process, the, our three remaining pairs of points. So 1228 and 1084, those are 144 apart. 144 apart. Our second to last pair of points is 1634 subtracted 1378, and that's 256 apart. So those are 256 feet apart from each other. And our final pair of points, where we have 2040 was hypothetical without gravity, subtracting our actual height of 1640. And that gives us a difference of 400 feet. So we want to basically figure out, well, how can I get a function that would represent the points that we have in our second table, the actual height? So I can enter in a second number of seconds and get the height when it's affected by the cannon and gravity. So we know we have these points. So we basically would have these points in green, and we would need to subtract a certain thing to get to the points in blue. Because you can see how we're just subtracting y values to go from green to blue for all of these points. And the difference from green to blue is these purple numbers right here. So those numbers might look familiar to you, in that those numbers are all from what we used for gravity in part one. So if we think about remembering some of those numbers, well, 16, that would be 16 times 1 second squared. 64 would be 16 times 2 squared. 144 is 16 times 3 squared. And you might be able to guess and see where this is going. So now we have 16 times four squared, and we're at four seconds here. And 400, this difference is 16 times five squared. And you can see that this is kind of matching up to what we were talking about in, a, in part one. We are getting each of these points by doing our original table minus 16 times the number of seconds squared. And even with zero, we could do zero 16 times, we could put right down here, 16 times zero squared. Well, that's obviously just equal to zero, so that gives us the difference. So what is basically happening is that if we have our equation over here that I'm circling in green, we're doing that equation minus these purple numbers. And those purple numbers are being represented by our equation from part one. And if we do that subtraction, we get the table in our, our second table. So for example, if we did 10 plus 406 times, let's say we'll pick two. If we then subtracted 16 times 2 squared, that answer that we would get is going to end up being 758 if you put that into your calculator. And that is the second row of our, of our new table. And we can double check that on a calculator by doing 10 plus 406 times 2 minus 16 times 2 squared. And that does, in fact, equal our answer here of 758. 
So now, if we wanted to put this in terms of x, we could do distance or, or y, whatever you feel more comfortable with, and basically say that our equation is 10 plus 406, let's write that again, 10 plus 406x, and then we are just subtracting what gravity is causing, which we know from earlier is just minus 16x squared. And this would be the equation that we would be able to use in this table. And so we can even go down here in Desmos and type in y equals 10 plus 406x minus 16x squared. And you can see that on our graph that it's matching perfectly to the points we set out earlier. Continuing with our lesson, we have another cannonball example here where we have a function which is d equals 50 plus 312t minus 16t squared, and that's t seconds after the ball is leaving the cannon. So first, think about the example we just did. We want to establish what does the 50 mean, what does the 312t mean, and what is negative 16t squared. Thinking back to the example we just completed, the 50 in the front, well, that would represent how high up are you at the very beginning. The 312t, that is representing your initial velocity or speed of your cannon, cannonball. And it would be going 312 feet per second, just like how the other example worked. And then that minus 16t squared we've seen a few times already in part one and now in part two. That is, telling, that is giving us the negative effect of gravity on the cannonball as it's slowing down and decreasing in distance as time goes on, as it goes up, because obviously gravity is pulling it downwards. So we're going to graph this function on Desmos and set our domain to 0 to 25 and then 0 to 2,000. And we're going to be looking to describe the shape of the graph, talk about the movement of the cannonball, maximum height it reaches, and estimate when it hits the ground. So let's take a peek at Desmos. We're back here at Desmos, and we have a distance in terms of t function that we just looked at, 50 plus 312t minus 16t squared. When you're in Desmos, how to set the domain, if you click on this wrench button, the x-axis down here, we wanted this to be 0 to 25, and I'm having it go up by 5s. And then for our y-axis, we have it from zero up to 2,000. And it's a good idea generally to label your x and y axis. So I'm gonna label my x axis as time in terms of seconds. And our y axis is distance, or we could say even height of cannonball. And that's also in terms of feet. You usually wanna have units involved for sure. So we've set our domain. So the first thing you might remember this shape, the name of this shape from a prior year of math, this is called a parabola. And so we have set our domain and range, our, set our window here on Desmos to see the whole, all the important stuff. And you can see how it makes sense that the cannonball would keep rising up in height, get it to its maximum height that it's gonna reach. And then because of how gravity works, it will start to fall back down again and accelerate kind of towards the ground since our gravity is here at the end at 16 t squared. So if we want to use Desmos here just to help us to do this. We want to look and see, well, what these numbers mean. So remember the 50 right here, the 50 is our initial height. Our Desmos can tell us that the maximum height that our cannonball reached was 1,571 feet in the air, and it took just under 10 seconds to reach that. And then lastly, we can see it's going to be in the air from obviously we have it at zero seconds when it's 50 feet in the air, and then it's gonna land at zero feet off the ground from when the equation equals zero again, and then it's gonna be almost 20 seconds that it's going to be in the air a little about 19.7 seconds to, to round it. 
And that would kind of show the entire length or the entire path that this cannonball would go through if it was shot directly up into the air. One additional thing is if you think about the word domain, is talking about what X's make sense for the problem you're working on. And in this case, our domain would be from zero seconds up until our cannonball reached the ground again, the total amount of seconds that we would care about. And so since we're so close to 20, I would probably say that an appropriate domain here would be from X or T for time being going from zero all the way to 20. We're now getting to summarizing part two here. So we've seen a lot of different expressions. The main ones we've covered in part one and two, talking about these things flying through the air, are that 16 T squared, that is what effect gravity is having on something. So it could tell you that 16 T squared is the distance covered if you drop something. And then it would become negative, in the, like in the second example, if you're starting from a height and taking away the height that gravity would take away kind of having that speed up and take away from the 400 feet that you're starting from. And then in our third expression, we are 50 feet off the ground. In this case, we're going a vertical speed of 100 feet per second. And then after t seconds, we have a negative 16 t squared being taken away from that height that it would initially be going up at. And we want to keep in mind that's kind of how this is all working. So 16 t squared, we think about when the object has traveled a distance of zero feet. This happens at time equals zero. So the word zero here is going to be important. So in, in the second case, the zero is a time when the height of the object is zero feet. And that's when it's going to hit the ground. So how many, what t seconds you have to be at where 400 minus 16 t squared would equal zero. And then the zero for the third expression there's a time when the, once again, when the height of the object is going to be zero feet, and we'd have to figure out the two, the value for t, where we can put in those two different places to make it equal to zero. That was like our example previously, where we said that it would be equal to zero when time was, or when t was equal to 19.7. As a final activity of the video, we are looking at a similar example here, and the height h of a rocket propelled by a short blast of air above the ground after t seconds is given by the equation 5 plus 100 t minus 16 t squared. And the graph on the right is representing the height h after time seconds, which is represented by the letter t. So we want to think about the answers to the 1, 2, 3, and 4. So based on this graph, the five is going to be the initial height and 100 T would be the initial velocity. How fast is the rocket being shot at after right after it's uh, started? The negative 16 T squared is what gravity is going to take away from the height if it was present in a real world scenario. And if we look at the graph itself to answer number four, we would see that it looks like it hits the ground a little after six seconds. So we would see that is what we call the zero of this graph. And that covers part two of describing situations using quadratic functions.